I want you to put one above and two below. Yep. Leave a little space. Yep. Pull smoothly and release. Ooh, Good beautiful. Shot. Nice rate shot. Hey. <laughs> I'm taking some target practice with my buddy Phil for my brother-in-law Steve, who's a master bow maker. Today is St. David's Day and we celebrate everything Welsh, including that most famous Welsh invention, the longbow. All right, Steve, let me show you how a Welshman handles a longbow. Step back. Oh, that's gonna leave a mark. You know, my abilities as an archer would be greatly disappointing to my Welsh ancestors, who considered archery skill a prerequisite to being Welsh. However, what I lack with a bow and arrow, I more than make up for in skill on my farm and in the kitchen. My Welsh heritage is the inspiration for tonight's meal. We're going to be having organic lamb chops, roasted parsnips, creamy Jerusalem artichoke puree, some wilted mash, an unbelievable looking mint oil, and we're gonna celebrate St. David's Day with a reading of The Outing by Dylan Thomas. Dude, it's gonna be smashing, man. Even early in the season, there's plenty to be found on our organic farm. Believe it or not, many vegetables survive the winter quite happily under the insulating blanket of snow. These fabric row covers are a lifesaver on my organic farm, helping to protect my crops from the winter elements. Before I start planting again, I gather up the covers, wash them, and recycle them for another season. Surprisingly, what survives the winter is an abundance of treasures, like Jerusalem artichokes and parsnips. These are some of the players in tonight's special St. David's Day meal. From North America, we have Jerusalem artichokes. These aren't like the globe artichokes, it's a different family. Globe artichokes are a thistle, Jerusalem artichoke is a sunflower, Heliopsis tuberosum. Now you grow these just like potatoes and you cook them just like potatoes. If you want a really nice light colored soup, you'd peel them first, but uh, most of the flavor and a lot of the nutrients on vegetables are on the outside, so if you don't have to, leave the skin on and just scrub them before you cook with them. Our English portion, parsnips. These were grown since the 1400s. It's a very old root vegetable, and uh, to me, it's got this smell that kind of is a mixture of coconut and licorice. And these have been stored in the root cellar, very, very dark, very cold and humid. And they're still nice and firm. And because of that, they're gonna be really, really sweet as well. From France, we have mash. Now, curiously enough, when you buy the seed, make sure you get untreated seed or organic seed. They're gonna smell a little bit like gym socks. <laughs> but uh, they make a nice tasting plant after they grow up out of the ground. It's sort of a minty, lovely mellow flavor, and it takes heat really well. You can wilt it without it all shriveling up and getting nasty. Mm. It's great. Now, this is the famous French salad ingredient, mash. This is gonna sound a little bit like that fishing story you should have been here yesterday, but trust me, this ground was covered with mash right through the winter. We were picking from it when the snows weren't too bad, but um, there's not that much left right now. I, like every good farmer, hedge my bets and I've got a great crop in the greenhouse. We'll go and take a look in there instead. All right, I found a better example of mash in our greenhouse here. Now it's also known as lamb's lettuce because it's grown at a time when the little lambs are born in early, early spring. It's a very cold tolerant and frost tolerant plant. You can also grow it in the fall and it'll even overwinter for you if your winters are mild enough. Now mash is also a great plant because it can tolerate extremely close growing conditions. And don't worry about thinning it out. You harvest the thinnings. Rather than taking individual leaves, Mash grows in what's called a rosette. So you'll take the entire rosette like this, take the straggly bottom leaves off, give it a clip with the scissors, and that's all you have to do. Mmm. That grit is unbelievable. And you can pack them really close together in a tray that you'd use for transplanting in the spring. Keep them in the soil like that in a cool, dark place like your root cellar, 
And these plants will stay green, closely packed together, and you can harvest them in December from your root cellar as well. Mash may look dainty and delectable, but it's a stubborn and smelly organic crop. Two things about mash seed. It's notoriously stinky, <laughs> and it's notoriously difficult to germinate. So we'll show you how to do it properly in this little bed here. First of all, you need a very level seed bed. We fill the hoppers with mash seed. Now in the greenhouse, I use one of these four row pinpoint seeders. Some seed companies also have a one row for people at home. The trick to getting mash to germinate really well is first of all to give it a really good tamping into the seed bed and then do the two foot mash shuffle. And this will press the seeds really firmly into the soil. You wouldn't believe how tiring this is. You know, I wouldn't want to do this for a couple of hours. Ta-da! Mash is done. Well, I better get my ass in gear. I've got another project that demands my attention. I got Tina a really neat present this Christmas. Something that reminds her a little bit of me, I think. <laughs> hey, kids, can you give me a hand with this? This is Jesus. He's a good little pep, and I think I'm gonna dig him up a treat from my garden. He likes parsnips, and they're the featured ingredient in tonight's dish, so we're gonna share some with him. Right, Jesus? Uh. Right. When we come back, we'll be digging for gold. Parsnips and artichokes for tonight's St. David's Day feast. look like a field of organic dreams, but buried just below the surface is a crop I've been waiting months for. Oh, how I love parsnips. They're so parsnippity. Now the best tasting parsnips you can grow will survive in your garden over the winter. The cold of winter will sweeten the parsnips, converting the starches into sugar. So let them get good and kissed by winter's cold, and they'll be the sweetest parsnips you've ever had. What happened in our fields here, the grass that was our enemy in the summer has turned into our friend for the winter because it's acted like a snow fence, and it's trapped the snow around the parsnip plants and insulated them so they haven't had too much cold damage. But you've got to time your harvest with parsnips because once this vigorous green growth starts in the spring, you want to get them out of the ground quickly because they'll start getting a little bit more bitter tasting as the tops get bigger, and then they'll flower, and then that's the end of it. Oh, boy, you can really smell the sweetness in these right now. Uh, the parsnips have been reaching for water. We grow them on hills, on raised beds, because every parsnip and carrot is a tap root, and it'll send down sort of an explorer root first into the soil, and then it'll fill it out as the season progresses. So if you've got a nice big hill of loose, easy to move through soil, you'll have nice, straight parsnips. Raw hot! My search for hidden treasure never ends. Now these piles of sticks down here in the soil aren't there by chance. They're put there by a great garden friend under the soil, giant earthworms called night crawlers. And what they do is come up to the surface of the soil at night and feed on dead and decaying plant material. They drag it down into their burrows about a meter under the ground and break it down into organic matter that the plant roots in turn can feed on. It's like having a team of quiet rototillers working in your soil at night while you sleep. Now underneath this layer of dead sticks is another early season perennial that we harvest this time of year. It's mint. This is the tarnished plant bug. This is really the only garden pest you're going to find in your mint patch. And when it feeds on mint, it leaves little brown specks on the leaves. It looks like someone shot it with a brown paint gun. And it's really just sort of cosmetic damage. Now mint comes in a huge range of colors and textures and most importantly aromas. What we've got here is a variety that I like to use. The darker leaved is apple mint and you can use it in both desserts and savory dishes like tonight's mint oil. On the other hand, this is pineapple mint. It's a lot paler in color. It's got some lovely yellow streaks in it, and it's got a real sort of citrusy overtone to it. In the fall, 
after the mint plants have died back, get some compost and top dress it. You don't need to work it in with mint because their roots primarily are on the surface. So spread the top dressing over the mint plants and then in the spring when they start to grow, they'll start feeding on that layer of compost that you've given them. Now I'm going to be using these to make a luscious mint oil to flavor tonight's lamb dinner. Mmm, kissable fresh. <laughs> Let's go inside and see what's cooking with Tina. Come along, Tegwin. There are some tasty treats awaiting us in the oh. kitchen. Mmm, oh. that smells good. Hi. Hi. Minty fresh breath, you've yep. been out in the mint patch. Yep. Well, you're in time for the last batch of Welsh cakes, hot off the grill. They smell good. What's in them? Well, they're really nice and golden this year with our free-range mm. eggs, huh? Mm. Hot off the grill. Now, you know, my Nana started... Uh, 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 uh. My Nana started this tradition in Wales years ago, and my mom brought it to Canada, and now you're doing it here. And here I am. I think you and... make the best ones. <laughs> Hooray! Easy on you the eyes, and that. a dab <laughs> hand in the kitchen, too. Isn't that great? Okay. Save some for me. Don't let the kids eat them all. All right, see ya. Time to uncover the last treasure for tonight's meal, Jerusalem artichokes. But be sure to dig them up before it gets too warm because they'll develop a bitter taste. Jerusalem artichokes are North America's only native vegetable. It's a sunflower that grows about nine or 10 feet tall and it's perfectly adapted to the winter climates of North America because the real crop you wanna eat is under the ground, these tubers that I'm picking. The stalks from the sunflower act as a snow fence and it traps all that insulating blanket of snow around the plants so that the tubers will overwinter. Now I harvest most of my Jerusalem artichokes in the fall, but every once in a while I'll leave a patch go and come and get it in the spring just for some spring exercise. Jerusalem artichokes you cook just like potatoes. You can roast them, you can puree them. They make a really wonderful soup. But for tonight with the lamb dish, we're gonna make a Jerusalem potato puree and I think it's gonna be well worth the effort. Jerusalem artichokes are another great plant to grow organically because there's very little insect pests that bother them and uh, even fewer diseases. Now each plant can produce about three or four pounds in really healthy, well-drained soil. Nature's bounty given for us by the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, there's some lovely ones down here. I always prefer to find local suppliers for the organic foods I can't provide myself. It helps the local economy and it's good for the community. My next stop is Macaulay Hill Farm, my supplier of organic meat. The lamb for tonight's St. David's Day feast is coming from local lamb farmer Dave Pullen. He's my kind of farmer. Obviously the vegetables, it's better to have vegetables local and fresh, but um, the, the food that we eat, the meat as well, it's important to get local too, isn't it? Yeah, what we're finding is more and more people seem to, seem to be interested in where the food's coming from and how it's produced. And yeah. They don't want all this transport. They want to know that something's fresh, it's coming from their local community. Yeah, well, it benefits what, everybody in the local economy, doesn't I think it? It keeps so. it going. Now, Dave, these uh, little fellas look way too cute to grace our dinner table. That's not the size lamb that we eat for Easter, is it? Not when you come here to our store, no. Our lambs are all raised up to just around 100 pounds or a little more, so at least three times this big. They look so happy and content. Of course, a happy animal is a very productive animal as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like yeah, the little leg warmers. Do you have them do any modern dance or anything like not that? Not too much. Warmers? No, no, we're uh, pretty <laughs> conventional that way. All right, girls, form a line. We could get something going here, I think. Well, it's obvious you're doing a great job here. They just look great. Well, thank you. I'll see you later, ladies. I'm off to cook with Phil. 
just as the Welsh helped the English at Agincourt, so the English are helping the Welsh today at St. David's Day meal. And what we've got is some organic lamb we've just got at uh, Dave Pullen's farm, McCully Hills. We're also going to be using Jerusalem artichokes from our farm and a puree with potatoes. Some parsnips, also from our farm. And mash, also known as? Lamb's lettuce. Very good. There you go. And mint oil. Beautiful looking mint oil, look at that. And uh, a honey and cider vinegar reduction. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So let's okay. get going with the lamb chops. I'm gonna season it with some salt, and we will sear them. Thank you. Oh, oh, smoking nice. Right. Okay, so we're gonna sear these just a couple of minutes on each side, just to seal in the flavor. Let me take that. So why do you sear them before you put them in the oven? Uh, you end up with a much more succulent meat at the end of it, if you just okay. sort of coat the outsides and, they, and you wait until they're they're nice and brown and when they lift off the pan easily that's when they're ready to turn which okay. we will do now and these guys are coming up now there's no sticking so we know they're good and browned on one side put a bit okay. of pepper my time in uh, Stratford cooking school has shown me how just how to do that perfectly from, right. from a height like that <laughs> so they tell me and that's how I've graduated to this jacket <laughs> I no, all longer, I no longer wear a t-shirt in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna put these into the oven 400 for about 10 minutes, that should do them. Oh, they look good. Fine. Parsnips is one vegetable that I do peel. Uh, I just find it more appealing that way. <laughs> <laughs> and just roast them with a bit of butter oh, and yeah. a bit of olive oil and a bay leaf. So these are going in the oven at about 400. Tell they're soft and uh, golden brown in 20 to 30 minutes. And a bit of Top oil. Top and tail, yep. Maybe a Touch of butter, maybe? Yep. What do you think? Why not? So, now see. They'll be fantastic in an hour. A couple of bay leaves and onto the stove. Brown them a bit first on the stove just to get them get the caramelization going. And then we're going to pop them into the oven. Yeah. In the okay, so I think these are ready to go into the oven now. Yep. They're nice and brown. Do it. Okay, now I think we're going to do the uh, Jerusalem artichokes. Okay. So we're going to put some some butter in these. So they've been in a bain marie. Yeah, just keeping them warm without them catching the bottom of the pan. Right. Now these yeah. are just made just like uh, potatoes, right? Juice and artichokes. You boil them up, and uh, the potatoes are boiled separately. We put the two of them together and pureed them. Then we've added an obscene amount of butter. And then, just to finish it off, mm -hmm. we'll add a little bit of heavy cream. Great. Back in the bain marie. Back dans le bain marie. Okay, I'll talk a bit about the mint oil we've got here. Now this is made by uh, blanching mint, curiously enough, yeah. uh, for about 10 seconds in boiling water, and then uh, draining it, putting it into a food processor, right? And adding about a half a cup of olive oil to it, or neutral oil, and putting it over a, a sieve with a paper towel in it or cheesecloth, and just letting it drip through. Okay, and what you're left with is this beautiful, beautiful lime green looking solution oh, here. Oh man, great. And it smells of mint. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, we'll plate this wonderful dinner and get ready for our Welsh celebration. I have been busy conjuring up a feast of lamb and spring vegetables for tonight's okay, St. Lamb. David's Day banquet. Parsnips. Great, great, great. Okay, so we're gonna put some mash on the plate first. Okay. I'm good at this artistic you part. You are. Brilliant, man, brilliant. Nice and high, nice and high. The heat from the chops is gonna wilt the mash just so. And yes. some parsnips on the side. And Phil, if you wanna do the honors with the J-chokes. There we go. And uh, you stand by with the oil. And I I've, uh, we've made a reduction here with some honey and some uh, cider vinegar. And we're going to put that on the outside like so. Oh, that smells good. You do the outside ring of honor with the mint oil. Really? Yeah. Give it a little <gasps> shake. I'm all nervous now. We'll just drizzle that a little, around a little bit. Perfect. I think St. David himself would be proud to eat this meal tonight. I'm sure he would. Oh, it's well, a lump in me throat, it does. I'm going to start singing in a minute, man. Men of garlic stand together. Very good. Well sung. Deal he vowed. There's no need for that. I was only came to help. <laughs> There's the man. Oh, you're the man. Thanks, Scott. Mm. Nectar of the gods. I'd like to welcome everybody today to Bijou on this fine St. David's Day. And uh, I want to tell you how much it means to me to have uh, 
people who mean so much to me celebrate a very important holiday to us Welsh people here. Uh, St. David's Day, March the 1st, is um, a time where we celebrate with song and poetry in Wales. In celebration of St. David's Day, Aaron Lindley, the chef at Bijou, helped us come up with an inspired seasonal menu to go along with our farm fresh produce and organic lamb. That is spring and <laughs> That's enough water for now. Okay, while everybody's enjoying their soup portion of the evening, I will start reading The Outing by Dylan Thomas, which was written in uh, 1953, I believe. So, The Outing, a story. Partly because he was so big and trumpeting and red the hair comes from the ceiling. She was so small, Dusk. of the hot cheesy shop, and my uncle blew and boogled whenever he won. Who goes there? Called out Will Sentry to the flying moon. <laughs> Happy St. David's Day. Our dinner tonight proves that no matter what the season, good organic farming and fresh local food will always bring together good friends. Parsnips and lamb. Can't beat it. Don't get any better than that. Plain and simple. Parsnips and lamb. Ah. They'd like to propose a toast in Welsh. Yachida. Yachida. <laughs> With mighty fork in hand, I'm Anthony John, growing vegetables for the benefit of organic humanity everywhere. A man outstanding in his field.